So uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, the uh, the focus uh, of my um, of my presentation today is really around the all of the routines and cadences and cycles that we go through to run Skillshare. And when I've got a group of uh, of CEOs I meet with regularly in New York, uh, we have our our monthly CEO group therapy breakfast. Uh, this is constantly a topic. You know, what are your how are you doing annual planning? How do you do OKRs? How do you do your review process? Uh, so this is a presentation version of a blog post I wrote uh, a couple of months ago just about kind of what are all of our routines, how we got there. Um, and so as I go through what we'll do, I'll try to pepper in kind of how things evolved over time. This is our version as we stand today. Like as I'm presenting this, our COO is rewriting some of this. So uh, I think that's the other thing to emphasize is it just does constantly change. And um, to touch on a couple of things that both Maynard and, and Ann uh, addressed. I think the so much of the CEO's job is around the people side. It is around alignment, um, and I think the that you know the idea of uh, ending up is the sort of chief therapist. A lot of that comes out of these processes when they're not running the right way. Uh, so as you start to find yourself playing that therapy role, what could you have done in your uh, overall operating cadences to to head that off? Um, so. There we go. Uh, so just a quick summary of Skillshare. Um, so we are a, a global learning community for creatives. So um, typical classes, 45 minutes to an hour long. We heavily focus on uh, things like illustration, photography, uh, design. Um, the We have about 90 employees, most of which are in uh, New York, but we have a fairly distributed team. Uh, UK, Canada, Romania, Costa Rica, uh, kind of all throughout the Midwest, uh, and we're kicking off an office in um, Medellin. So that, you know, as we talk through processes and as companies become distributed and global much earlier in their life cycle, a lot of what we're doing has evolved around this. Uh, so when we think about our operating cadence and what we're trying to solve, uh, there's really th three things that we're, we're angling for. One is just consistency of operations. Um, when... Uh, there's a concept that uh, I picked up from a kind of an early management training about this idea of your job as the manager is not to row, it's to keep the boat steady um, and let everybody else pull. And because if the boat's rocking back and forth, nobody can row, you're not going anywhere, it's super uncomfortable. Um, so the operating consistency is really important so people just know that they can pull like hell and the boat's going to go. Um, the consistency of strategy, and this is something I think a lot of small, earlier stage companies struggle with, is just that whipsaw of, all right, well, that didn't work this week. Let's go the other direction. Let's try something else. Um, so you've got to have enough spacing between your big strategic decisions that you actually give things a chance to work or not work. You actually collect the right data. Your team has a chance to buy into it and actually put some muscle behind it. Um, so we want to space out some of the longer, uh, the bigger strategic decisions. Uh, and then constantly balancing what's that three, four, five, ten year vision with what do we need to get done this week, this month, this quarter. Uh, so those are, as we've gone through this and as we evolved it, uh, those were always the three things that we were solving for. So uh, we'll start with just kind of our annual and semi-annual routines. Performance reviews. Um, so performance reviews are, you know, I've sort of joked, uh, like what would happen if we just didn't do them? Uh, you know, what would be the impact on the company? What would we lose? What would we miss out on? Um, and we have, one of our execs was from Google. Her head almost came off of her body. Uh, they just, you know, they have very structured ways of going through these performance reviews. Um, but you know, we really talk about what are we trying to get out of it and what cycle do we want. Um, we do a January, a heavy review in January with a light mid-year check-in. We do 360s. Uh, we try to consolidate all of the compensation discussions in January. One of the struggles I've had in past roles is it's just a running gun battle of people wanting more money. Um, and, you know, it's a competitive market, particularly in, you know, in technical roles. So having a defined period where we're going to talk about your comp and your equity on this date. Um, and so unless something extraordinary has happened, this is where we're going to have that conversation. Let's talk about what you want professionally. Let's talk about what kind of impact you're driving. We can have those conversations constantly. Uh, but comp and equity happen in January. Um, we have we used to have a heavier mid-year check-in. We've made that lighter. 
we're actually in the process of getting rid of the mid-year check-in and just go to quarterly. And the reality is you shouldn't be having any conversation in January that's a surprise. Uh, so as you're managing people, how are you training your how are you training your managers to make sure that they are constantly having those conversations? They're giving lots of small corrections and feedback and input and guidance along the way so that you don't have this big ta-da moment in January where you say, I've actually been very unhappy with your performance this year and it has caught them completely off guard. So, um, you know, I think performance reviews, you got to be really careful um, to contain certain conversations, but make sure that a lot of the guidance and feedback is just happening consistently throughout the year. So annual planning. Um, our annual planning process, um, again, is focused very much in Q4. This ties into OKRs, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but we've gone to a heavy uh, Q4 planning for the coming year, and then we have a sort of a mid-year refresh. So the Q4 planning process, which we're about to kick off, we start with a company-wide survey. So this is, you know, Ann touched on this earlier. Um, and really, we're trying to get as many ideas, concerns, things they're excited about, try to get all of that information on the table up front. And then the management team and I go through that in detail, and then we start to consolidate, all right, here's what we think from a top down, here's what the company is telling us from bottom up, how do we start to consolidate that into the high level strategy? Um, we then come back to kind of the director levels and say, all right, here we think are the three primary goals for the year, here's, we th here's what we think the core strategy is to get there, give us feedback, let's iterate on that, and then you come back with departmental bottoms-up strategies. So there's always this balance between bottoms-up, which gives you lots of buy-in and surfaces lots of new ideas, versus top-down, which helps you get a, just a more cohesive strategy. If it's purely bottom-up, it turns into everybody doing the project that they want to do, and you've got to try to come up with some consolidating strategy that makes sense. If it's completely bottoms-down, it might be very tight and cohesive, but nobody really understands what you're doing and why. So we try to constantly kind of bounce back and forth until we end up with what we think is a very good top-down strategy with everybody feeling buy-in and what they're going to work on day-to-day. -day. Um, the mid-year refresh is a lot of just what's working, what's not, what have we learned, um, how do we want to redirect, how has the market changed. So we try to keep the, the mid-year refresh fairly light, but it just depends. If all hell broke loose in your industry, it might be a complete scrapping of, of the uh, annual plan. If things are cranking, you feel really good, let's just do more of it, then it can be pretty light. Um, but the amount of overhead that goes into planning has to balance out with the frequency that you're doing it. So you're either doing lots of short, quick sessions, which makes it hard to kind of have the big long-term vision, uh, or you've got a heavier annual focus, but then you, you just can't afford to do You can't spend a month planning every single quarter. And we had gotten into that dynamic before, so that's how we ended up with this structure. Um, so the, uh, the other thing that we run is the employee engagement survey. So this is different than our planning survey. This is just, how do you feel about working here? How do you feel about our culture? What are we doing well? What are we not doing well? How can we improve? And then we start to look at all the data by team, department, manager, function, tenure, location, to look for hot spots. Um, and we currently use um, um, uh, CultureAmp for this, uh, but if you know the the cheap version is Google Forms, you can you can do some amazing things with Google Forms. Uh, Gallup has an engagement survey that they created years ago. It's like the I think it's the twelve yeah it's the twelve questions that kind of indicate long term engagement and retention. Um, so however you know whatever system you use, as long as it's consistent over time, you can start to spot trends. You can see what's working. You can see which managers and which departments are more or less healthy than others. Uh, and we found that data to be super helpful. Uh, and when you go back to the managers and you go back to those departments with, look, your team is doing better or worse relative to other teams in these areas, it just the, gives them some really concrete things to think about uh, as they go into um, planning their own departmental uh, initiatives and their own management and, and uh, performance training. OKR, so this is always the hot topic. Um, I don't, raise your hand, anybody using OKRs? Um, how many of you use them as a performance me uh, measurement for at the individual level? Um, and how many use them more as just an overall alignment tool? Um, so we have tried both. We ended up with using it uh, as alignment. Um, either one can work, uh, but I think what we found was 
when we tried to use it as a personal accountability, people started to sandbag. And as soon as we did that, they just they get watered down. It, they're no longer aggressive. We want the kind of the 70% threshold. You need to be 70% confident that you can hit that number. Or if you came in at 70%, we're okay with it. Because uh, we want people pushing. We want people thinking bigger. Um, and so we start with company-level goals that come out of that annual planning and the kind of that, that top-down strategy. Um, then we figure out, all right, what are the departmental goals to support the company? And then what are the individual to support department? So at any time... We want people to be able to look into, you know, whether it's, you know, whatever tool you're using to track your OKRs and draw a very clear connection to what they're doing every single day all the way up to the top line company goals and strategy. Um, because, again, I think a lot of the people issues, a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of attrition is when employees don't feel connected to the broader mission and the broader goals. Like, okay, I walk in every day, I work my ass off, I don't know why. Like, why does this matter to the company? How am I moving the needle? When employees feel very connected to the overall mission, uh, it tends to drive more engagement and retention. So uh, quarterly routines. So these are the things we're doing every couple months. Uh, we do a quarterly business review. So we bring in all of the employees. We do a half day of work. Uh, we talk about our OKRs, how we're progressing. We go through the key business metrics. We review the financials. Um, I go very deep on financials and metrics. Um, transparency is a big thing for us. I can't expect you to help me fix the engine if I don't tell you where the problems are. Um, the other analogy I've used is uh, when the house is on fire, there are the people who grab a bucket, there are the people who run screaming from the building, and there are the people who just stand there and shout fire. Uh, the third bucket is the worst. Um, the, uh, so, you know, we want people to understand where are the fires in the business so they can help us put them out. Um, so we do, uh, we do all the reviews, the metrics. We then usually pick a couple deep dive topics. So whether that's something new that we uh, are excited about, whether it's a particular area that we're concerned with, uh, maybe it's a completely new initiative. We, we're in the process of working on a, a new brand effort. That was the hot topic for the most recent QBR. Um, so we try not to get too bogged down into the, you know, Matt droning on about uh, metrics. Um, and it's usually stuff that, you know, really gets the team excited and, um, and fired up for the coming quarter. And then we do a QA. and a And anything goes, you got a question, now's the time to hit me with it. Um, and, uh, and then we try to wrap it up in a half day. And then we go do a half day of fun. So we break up into different groups. We go out and, you know, we do rock climbing. We, we usually have an active group, a drinking group, and an artsy group. Uh, or and so things usually tend to fall along those lines, and then we all come back and, and have a happy hour. So QBR is a lot of fun. Given that 20 uh, of our 90 employees are outside of the office, there's always just great energy that week because everybody's coming together. Uh, so QBR weeks are always a lot of fun. Uh, and then the roadmap refresh. So the product and engineering teams, I mean, they're constantly grooming the backlog and going through a you know traditional agile sprint process. But we do a heavier roadmap refresh on a quarterly basis. So again, kind of as we see the OKRs shaping up, as we see how we're performing against that quarter, uh, they'll go back and, and update the, uh, the roadmaps. Uh, so the monthly routines that we go through, we have a monthly all hands meeting. So every third month that becomes the QBR, uh, the monthly all hands are pretty quick. So it's usually an hour, hour and a half. Um, we go through the financials, again, progress against OKRs. If you're gonna use OKRs, you just got to keep them front and center. And, and it's hard, and it takes a lot of discipline on the management's part, but we really try to keep those front and center. Um, we do, again, one or two deep dives. Uh, so, again, this is kind of a mini QBR. Uh, we do a quick Q&A uh, Q &A and then team lunch. So, as you see, like, we try to pepper in lots of opportunities for the employees to either give us feedback through the surveys, ask us tough questions through Ask Skillshare Anything. We'll circulate a form. Uh, so they can ask them anonymously, um, or you know they can stand up and ask the question in front of everyone. So we're just constantly trying to pull feedback and questions and concerns out of uh, out of the team. Uh, they uh, everybody goes into the system and updates their OKRs, so that's usually pretty quick. Uh, again, we use Lattice, but uh, Google Sheets works just fine. Um, and then you can always see how that's laddering up to the company level progress. Uh, and then the weekly, bi-weekly bi routines, 
We have departmental meetings usually every one to two weeks. Most teams, it's week. A lot, uh, oh, it's, it's once a week. Um, goals are information sharing, decision making, uh, and then keeping track of the uh, the key metrics. Um, these get really expensive as the team gets bigger. And so when you're a five to 10 person team, the company wide meeting is not that expensive. When you're a 90 person team and you've got half the company in a weekly meeting, it adds up in a hurry. Um, and they have the little calculators where you can see just how expensive that meeting is by every uh, minute. I've been tempted to implement them. Uh, so just things like having clear agendas, having a defined note taker, everybody coming prepared. Um, and again, whether that's a well thought out PowerPoint or the Amazon style six page memo, either one works, but just show up ready to go with a very clear agenda and very defined outcomes. Uh, and then business operations meetings. So our biz ops meetings are on Monday. That's the executive team and director levels. Um, and really, we the goal there is kind of early identification of any issues, communications across the teams. So there's a lot of, hey, this team is working on that. You guys need to know about it. Um, so we'll start out with the metrics review. We use Chartio for our BI tool, um, run through the high level numbers, flag anything that looks off, uh, the data team will have already explored any aberrations and show up with, hey, our, our free trial conversion rate tanked this week, and it was because of X. Um, we then uh, we go through all of our top company-level OKRs, talk about just the little thing, little wins that happened last week, uh, and then we have kind of any uh, miscellaneous announcements, things we need to share across companies. So the that director level. My view is that as you grow, that director level is where the magic happens, right? They're the connection between the executive team and where most of the work gets done. Uh, so having very strong, well-informed, super engaged director levels, that's, that's really where a lot of the successes and failures come from. Uh, it's also what drives a lot of alignment within the company as you scale. Uh, and then our management team meetings. So we have two different management team meetings. Um, we have a flex agenda on Monday right after the business operations meeting, and it's anything, you know, it's a free-for-all. So we've got a shared Google Doc, anything that you want to talk about, anything you need to share, any concerns you have, you drop it in. So we hash out a lot of interdepartmental questions, concerns, issues in that meeting. Um, and we separate that from the Wednesday meeting, which is our strategy meeting. And that's where we go deep. So we'll have usually one or two topics that we'll go deep on a lot of prep work coming into that. It's scheduled weeks in advance. It's typically one of our director levels is coming in to present. Uh, and that it, we sort of treat it as our mini board meeting, right? So we want director levels and manager levels to come in, present to us. We hash through all the issues. We have the big conversations uh, in the same way that I get to march in once a quarter uh, and have the board meetings. So um, it's I think it's just good training for how people present, how people uh, respond under fire? Have they really thought through uh, what information they want to communicate to the executive team and, and what we're trying to what we're trying to accomplish? So that those Wednesday strategy meetings are probably the most valuable meetings we have. Uh, and then one on ones, and this is something that we've started investing a lot more in is just training managers on one on ones. I'm assuming most companies have one on ones with their direct reports. The we have found as we've dug into this, the quality of one on ones varies greatly. So having some kind of structure and training, find what do you want to get out of a one-on-one, -on -one, who sets the agenda, what you're talking about. Um, and again, I think uh, Ann touched on a lot of the sort of the good questions of how can I help you, what do you need, what roadblocks do you have. And we try to have the direct report set the agenda. So the, the structure I've used in the, the past is the four Ps. So plan, so that's kind of your OKRs, your larger, longer-term thinking. Um, we just keep that at the top. We don't talk about it a lot. Um, progress, what happened last week that you want to share, any good news, uh, problems, what blockers do you have, what can I help you with, what can I blow out of your way, uh, and then priorities, what, what do you want to accomplish in the coming week, and, and what do you need from me to get there. So it's just a very simple, clean structure, a lot of different versions, but I think whatever system you pick, pick a system, train your team on it, make sure that you're getting as much out of those one-on-ones as you can. Uh, and then that's also, again, that's your opportunity to give all those little uh, bits of feedback that uh, that should build up into your annual reviews. Uh, and then Friday Town Hall. Uh, so this is kind of our wrap for the week. 
talk about any wins, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, personal congratulations. So-and-so had a baby. So-and-so's running a marathon next weekend. Um, we try to keep them upbeat. Um, we talk just like a couple sentences about what's keeping me up at night. What am I thinking about? Um, and then, uh, we send a newsletter, uh, after with the exact same content. Um, there's nothing I love more than, well, I didn't know about that. It's like, well, we had the meeting. I sent the memo. I talked to you about it at lunch yesterday, you know, so I think the, you just have to communicate and communicate and communicate. Um, and, uh, you know, the, I always say, if they're not making fun of you behind your back, you haven't said it enough. So, um, we, uh, we try to really push, uh, make sure we're, we're, we're hitting them from multiple angles. Um, so, you know, I think the, you know, the big takeaway here is it, this is going to evolve over time. This is how we do it. This is how we've gotten there over three years. Uh, I've got lots of horror stories about the time that I hijacked the white, uh, the big whiteboard and just put numbers up. Uh, and I had a 9 a.m. metrics meeting on a Monday morning. Uh, you would have thought it was the Baton Death March. Uh, so I evolved. We created some new versions. Uh, but I think the, uh, you know, what you're doing now isn't going to work. Uh, 12 months from now, and um, you're going to have to constantly uh, iterate on that and make sure that you're making it more efficient, more effective as the company grows. So with that, uh, any questions? How do you deal with, so you said, um, both performance and comp reviews in January, but is startups flex and grow, ups and downs, yeah. just have you had a point along the journey where the company wasn't doing well, Right in January, do you do a comp review anyways, or do you hold it yeah. off to like get through that chapter and wait till you know just how, how structured and flexible yeah, I mean, over time? Yeah, you want to be structured and consistent, but not dogmatic. Um, and we have the one issue that we ran into a couple years ago. We were just way behind on our comp levels for engineers, and so as we started growing and we needed to expand the engineering team, like our comp just wasn't up to snuff. And we, we have a no negotiation policy. So everybody who comes in as a mid-level engineer makes the same thing out of the gate, zero negotiation. So for us, it was how do we make sure that what we're offering in that policy is consistent and competitive? We weren't competitive. Uh, so there were some situations where we had to, all right, we're 20K off for a mid-level engineer in New York City. We got to bump our comp up. Everybody gets a raise. Um, so we've had a couple of those points where we just realized that we couldn't wait till the next January to make that adjustment. And we responded accordingly. Yeah. Question to the end, quality of reviews. Mm -hmm. So I think like series and track numbers, store numbers, share numbers, et cetera, um, the earlier shift the company is, I think it's even more important to track the quality of the week. Um, but it's really hard to share that, to share that away and nothing gets lost. Mm -hmm. Any non-obvious tips that we need to go blog and share? <coughs> Yeah, and I guess when you say qualitative, what do you mean? Um, uh, I mean, like, things that you can't put number two. Yeah, I mean, well, there's there's sort of management by objective. So, you know, maybe your OKR isn't grow it from X to Y percent. It's get this thing across the finish line. Uh, or it's learn this particular, you know, like, I think there you can morph OKRs to be, you know, bin binary, you did it or you didn't. Uh, red, yellow, green, or hard percentage. We've actually found that red, yellow, green works better than picking a hard number, uh, just because it just builds a little more flexibility and it makes it a little less of a personal performance issue. Um, one thing that we do on the qualitative side is just how are you uh, reflecting our values? Um, and that's something we talk about uh, quite a bit. So we'll, there's a specific part of the 360 and a, a specific part of the, uh, the review structure where we talk about values and some of the more qualitative things. Because um, there, you know, look, there are situations where people completely whiff on their numbers. It's not their fault. They did all the right things. Or we as a company deprioritized mid-year something that were mid-quarter, something that they were personally responsible for that they, there's no way they're going to accomplish it. So that's where uh, you, know, you just, you got to look at kind of the, the more holistic view and not be too, you want to be structured, but not ridiculous. For a team of 10 to 15 people, how much of those routines are necessary that you put up? Yeah, um, probably fewer, a lot fewer. Uh, you know, I, the, so the problem that I'm trying to solve with a lot of the structure and all of the sort of redundancy and overlap is that communication and alignment problem. Because as you right now, you got 10 people in the same room, everybody can hear the phone calls, everybody's on Slack, like you, the, 
the dissemination of information and the alignment of where you're going and why is just a lot easier. Uh, it gets geometrically more difficult as you add headcount. Um, so, you know, I think if you can get away with a daily standup or a weekly all hands, and then you've got, you know, a quarterly or uh, semi-annual meeting for kind of the bigger decisions and the longer term vision and road mapping, that's great. So I, you know, I think the, you want to do as little of this as possible, um, but maintain that line of communication, make sure that you keep the alignment because as you get big, alignment will start to scatter if you don't have the right structure in place. This is a follow-up question. How, do, how can you tell when things are not working uh, in terms of communication that you need to start putting in place? Yeah, I mean, so the question is how do you, how do you know when, uh, when it's not working? You start to, um, you see people working on stuff, and you're like, Wait, help me understand why, why did we work on that? And I didn't know we were even working on it, and how does that line up to, you know, you start to see people spinning off in directions that might be interesting and might be exciting and might be impactful, but they don't line up with where you had a, as a company had agreed to go. Um, or you get the opposite of like, I don't understand why I'm working on this. Like this, uh, so you start to get questions from them that make it clear they're just not aligned. They don't understand why you're going that direction or why that particular goal is important. I'd be curious if there's any change for teams that are remote. And if there are any best practices or kind of policies you guys yeah. have found that are really effective for teams like that? Yeah, so for remote teams, I think the, the documentation is super important. So like for the, for the annual plan, I will actually write up a, you know, an Amazon style memo of here's our strategy for 2020. And I will send it out to everybody. Everybody can go into Google Doc, they can comment on it, they can drop feedback, they can drop questions. So we try to like layer a lot of these communications of, we do the presentation in a company meeting, then I send out a newsletter, then I send out a doc, like we're hitting them with the same message from multiple angles, specifically because, all right, you know, maybe they just couldn't hear because I wasn't near the microphone or I have it of covering the bottom, which I guess is where all the sound comes from. Uh, yeah, so there's those little, things, just trying to layer that communication. The other thing that has really helped is upgrading our hardware in the conference rooms. I mean, it's such a like tactical, ridiculous thing, but, I think our alignment for the dis the distributed team went up 50% because we just bought a better speaker so they could hear what the hell was going on. Um, so uh, those little things go a long way. And we use Google Hangouts and we bought some fancier speakers. Uh, but the um, you know at some point we're going to upgrade to Zoom. Uh, you know, so there's just little tactical operational things that make it much much easier for the distributed teams. How do you guys think about uh, like laddering or promotion within the company? Um, and also on the flip, how do you think about like termination? And is that like a conversation that people understand? Yeah. Uh, so the so for promotions, yeah, I think the you know, whenever you can promote from within, that's the way to go. Um, so and yeah, but as you're growing, if you're growing rapidly, they're just. You know, the uh, I think Maynard made the comment of like the in a high growth company staying in the same role as a promotion. That's really hard to communicate um, because look, high you know uh, high caliber people and high performers they want they want to progress in their career. They want more responsibility. And saying you got more responsibility, you're doing the same job for a company that's four x the size. <laughs> that doesn't doesn't really go over well. Um, so we've tried to create those opportunities. We've also tried to create cross functional opportunities. We actually had a, a guy on our operations team who decided he wanted to be an engineer. And I was like, all right, great. You know, so he started taking coding classes and now he's, uh, he's the lead engineer on our enterprise offering. Um, so trying to find those paths, it's really hard. It creates a lot of work. Um, when you have to hire over people and layer them, um, you know, I, I think the, I always try to tie it back of like, what's best for you? If I put you into a role and you fail, that is not good for you. Nothing will kill your career faster than me promoting you and failing. Um, so how do I bring someone in that you can really learn from, that you can grow and develop by watching them do it because they've done it at scale, they've seen things you haven't seen yet, not because you can't, just because you just haven't had the exposure. Um, and I've had it happen to me. Uh, they hired over me at one point at Odesk. I was super pissed. Uh, but, you know, like if they bring in the right person, you learn a lot. Um, so I think the... Um, trying to tie it back to what's best for their growth. Uh, if you lead with that message, again, whether it's best thing for your growth is you got a new promotion or the best thing for your growth is we need to 
reorganize who you're working for. Um, we try to tie it back on what's best for them in the end. As a small team, we have our uh, full-time team. Then we also hire out some independent contractors or part-time mm -hmm. roles. And I'm curious, given your background at Upwork and yeah. also what Skillshare does, do you have a version of this for those types of mm -hmm. roles where they're not? Yeah. Part so of your what's the career team? path for the customer service team through Upwork in the Philippines? Uh, I mean, or, as an example, yeah. or yeah, or like we have um, like therapists who work with us mm -hmm. who are independent contractors, but they uh, are okay. with us long term right. as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the there's sort of the, like in that case where you basically have a community of experts that are contributing to your company but aren't necessarily employees. I mean, we see that with our teachers, you know, so it's things like uh, we have a tiered um, teacher support structure. So we have our Skillshare originals who are influencers that we recruit onto the platform. They get the white glove treatment. We produce classes for them, a lot of joint publication and promotion. So they, you know, there's probably a hundred of those. Uh, then we have our top teacher program, which is teachers who've kind of worked their way up to the platform. They get a named support rep. Anytime they have an issue, they can pick up the phone and call somebody and get help. Uh, then we have our teachers to watch, who is kind of our top 10%. Uh, we give them newsletters we give them we tell them what's hot like so we give them we sort of tiered it out to make them feel like they're sort of moving up within the skillshare teaching community um so i think there's some and you, know, you see similar dynamics on upwork of uh you know top tier freelancer top 10 percent um up and comer like they've they've created some marketplace mechanisms to to allow that sort of feeling of growth even though they happen to be a freelancer not necessarily associated with the day-to-day uh, employment. No, I mean, well, for our teachers, for our teachers, no. Uh, but for like our customer support team, so customer support, trust and safety, we use a lot of Upwork freelancers. Um, you know, we we measure them against you know quality of response, customer satisfaction, speed, uh, all of those things, and they get uh, bonused and compensated. Uh, for achieving those and then you know the good ones get to take on management roles and manage other freelancers so we do have some of uh, some similar mechanisms you got to be a little careful uh, you know about how much control you exert depending on the jurisdiction you're in that sort of thing but um, but yeah we try to build in some of the same mechanisms all right thank you appreciate it